Good day. The last 24 hours it's become again somewhat more difficult to work out exactly what has been happening on the Ukrainian battlefields. But we do have some information, though all the facts are somewhat difficult to piece together. I'm going to do a relatively brief summary of what I can work out, and then I'm going to deal with the more pressing or perhaps more um, <laughs> urgent or more dramatic events which connect, relate to the evolving economic war. But let's first of all, as we traditionally do, or at least as I traditionally do, touch on the situation in the battlefields. Now, in my previous video, it looked as if the Russian forces were on the brink of clearing the Andreyka pocket, the bridgehead that the Ukrainians had established south of the Ingulets River in this area called um, near, near the small town or large village of Andrijka. Um, a few hours later, however, we got information about an, a surprise Ukrainian attack on a completely different part of the front line, attacking a village, a large village of about three, three with a population before the war of about 3,000 people, small town if you prefer, called Visokopolye. Now, the information about what happened over the course of this attack is not entirely clear, but it's clear that the Russians were taken by surprise, that the Russian paratroopers who were defending this town, Visokopolye, pulled back, that the Ukrainians captured a large building, some suggest it was a hospital, raised their flag, photos then circulated in the media, and reports followed that the Ukrainians had captured this village, Visokopolye, which is located some distance east from the Andrevka bridgehead. Then later in the afternoon, we got news that the Russians had counterattacked and were trying to recapture at least most of this village, or at least that part of the village that they'd surrendered to the Ukrainians, that they retreated from um, in response to the Ukrainian attack. Thereafter, information basically froze up, and we don't have very much information one way or the other. The Riba, this uh, collective, this some anonymous collective of journalists that I've spoken about in the, bar, in the past, has suggested on the strength of a report from a Ukrainian journalist, a rather garbled report from a Ukrainian journalist, that the Russians have indeed recaptured Visokopolye. Well, I'm going to say straight away, I've seen this report by the Ukrainian journalist. It seems to me highly ambiguous. I'm not going to make any assumptions upon it. As of this moment in time, I'm going to continue to assume that the Ukrainians still hold Visokopolye. They have previously attacked Visokopolye earlier over the course of the Kherson offensive. Um, they were then driven back from the positions that they'd captured in Visokopolye. Perhaps that will happen again, perhaps not. We'll just have to wait and see. Now, we have heard nothing, however, about what is happening on the bridgehead south of the Ngulets River, except that there's been heavy shelling, and the Russian Ministry of Defense has told us that the Russian Air Force and missile forces destroyed the forward base, the Ukrainian forward base, north of the Ingulets River, in which these Ukrainian forces that had been seeking to exploit this bridgehead were concentrated. I'm going to now venture a guess, and I want to stress this is purely a guess. I don't have particular information here. I'm not in a position to say whether or not this is true. It's just a guess, and I repeat again what I've said many times, that I am not a military person. It's clear that the Russians were taken by surprise by this attack on Visokopolye. 
we learned that the Ukrainians made no artillery preparation in advance of the attack. There are suggestions that the Ukrainians again have suffered heavy losses in attacking Visokopolye. I wonder whether what might have happened is that the Ukrainians, unable to advance as they'd intended through the Ingulets bridgehead, then diverted some of their forces overnight to attack Visokopolye, which is some distance further east. Purely a guess, maybe the distances are too great. Others, if they want, can come and comment on this. But I wonder whether this is perhaps what has happened. Anyway, there is a bigger story behind all of this because we're now getting more and more information that the Ukrainians, far from giving up on this Kherson offensive, are apparently proposing to double down. Now, there is a Ukrainian channel called, or rather telegram channel, or, 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 or news page called Legitimi, and they've given us some idea of the totality of the Ukrainian forces that are now being committed to the Kherson offensive. I want to stress now, because I'm far from convinced that this was the original battle plan. But anyway, um, Legitimi talks about a first wave of 5,000 men, committed presumably on the first day, followed almost immediately by another 10,000 uh, in a second wave. Now that closely correlates to the 15,000 men that I heard, uh, that I heard from, um, sources say was the total number of four troops that the Ukrainians had committed to the Kherson counteroffensive in its first day. In fact, it correlates almost exactly, assuming that this first and second waves are really one and the same attack over the first couple of days. And even Legitimi appears to accept that these two waves, or I would say really one wave, were very, very badly battered, that they suffered extremely heavy losses. The Russians claimed that around 3,000 men were killed out of 15,000, and that there may have been 8,000 wounded. And it's been suggested that the equivalent of an entire division of the Ukrainian army has been destroyed over the course of this fighting, which, if you accept the Russian numbers, is true and gives us some idea of the enormous devastation this force of 15,000 appears to have suffered. Then Legitimi says that there was what it calls a third wave, or third or fourth wave, third and fourth wave. I don't really understand Legitimi's waves. But anyway, a new grouping of about 10,000 men who Ukraine has now committed to the battle. And that, by the way, correlates fairly closely with what the Russians are themselves saying, that there are now around 10,000 Ukrainian troops fighting along the Kherson battlefronts. And this presumably includes the Ukrainian troops in the Ingulets bridgehead and the Ukrainian troops who have captured, as I believe, Visokopolye, and we're now trying to presumably hold on to Visokopolye in the face of Russian counterattack. So that's 10,000. And then Legitimi says that behind this third and fourth wave, I would say more appropriately second wave, there is going to be another wave. Um, Legitimi says it's the fifth wave, I would say it's the third wave. And this force, which apparently consists of a large number of reservists, people in the sort of territorial um, brigades, these are civilians who rapidly recruited, given um, a, a very brief training and then packed into these brigades as part of a force that... Uh, to fill up the numbers. Anyway, that this 
last wave is to consist of 20,000 men. Now, I think this makes a certain sort of sense. You have a first attack involving 15,000 men. That was chewed up disastrously by the Russians. It's obviously suffered very severe losses. As I said, out of those 15,000, perhaps half, perhaps more, are casualties. Always, of course, if you believe the Russian numbers. I'm going to come to the credibility of Russian statements in a moment. But anyway, everybody accepts, legitimately accepts that this force, this initial force of 15,000 men, legitimately speaks of two waves, but it looks to me like it was one force of 15,000 men, has to all intents and purposes been destroyed. The second, but that presumably was the force that was going to make the initial breakthroughs. Then the second force of 10,000 was to consolidate those breakthroughs. And I'm going to speculate here that since the key breakthrough was supposed to be this bridgehead across the Ingulets River, then that 10,000 man force was supposed to cross into the bridgehead and press forward and then advance towards Novaya Kachovka. I'm going to come to my pronunciation of this name, of the name of this place uh, properly in a moment. But anyway, this is going to be the main axis of Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian advance. And that was what this 10,000 man force that we now see in operation, that that was what it was intended to do. And then once this bridgehead had been consolidated and the breakthrough had been consolidated, then the big numbers, the 20,000 men, the infantry that were to storm Novaya Kakhovka and consolidate the Ukrainian victory, they were supposed to follow up. Hasn't worked out like that. The 15,000, as I said, were defeated, suffered heavy losses. The 10,000 have not so far as I know been able to consolidate or advance from the Ingulets bridgehead. In fact, the last information was that the Russians were working on shutting down the bridgehead. I'll come back to that in a moment. It may be that they've been diverted towards this attack, towards Visko, Vis Visokopolye, but again, you know, that's my guess. <laughs> I'm not certain that this is the case. But anyway, that, that's, as I said, the, the, the next way that was supposed to exploit this advance. And the remaining 20,000 are still there. They consist, as I said, to a great extent of reservists. That's not clear what they're going to be doing if the follow-up force fails to break through. So that's what we can see. That's my inference or speculation about what's going on on the battlefield in Kherson region. I'm going to just want to add one thing. I said that the Russians were taken by surprise uh, by this Ukrainian attack at Visokopolye, that the Ukrainians attacked without artillery preparation, that the Russians um, ceded ground, which, by the way, is the right thing to do. One doesn't fight for every millimetre. That, it seems to me, is a wasteful strategy. Anyway, that the Russians pulled back, though some hours later they seem to have attempted some sort of counterattack. But anyway, regardless, um, it seems that the Russians were taken by surprise. I wonder whether one of the reasons they were taken by surprise is because they were concentrating all their attention and all their effort on clearing up the Ingulets bridgehead. Uh, there are some reports, notably from Riba, that lend some credence to that theory. But there we go. Sometimes people take the eye off the ball and things can go wrong. And if the Ukrainians did take advantage of the Russians getting focused in one direction and losing track 
of what was going on in another. Well, all credit to them. But anyway, we will see how this develops. Now, I've discussed the forces that the Ukrainians appear to be committing to this battle in Kherson region. There are growing reports now of a major Russian buildup. I say growing reports. What we see are repeated films of large Russian troop trains crossing into Crimea over the Kerch Bridge, supposedly heading for Kherson region. Now, these appear to consist of large numbers, very large numbers of armoured vehicles, artillery, you name it. And it's ob not obvious, you can't say with any confidence, what exactly these forces are supposed to do. But perhaps inevitably one has to speculate that they're being sent to deal with the Herson counter-offensive. Now, that brings me back to this vexed discussion about the Ukrainian attacks on the bridges. The Antonovsky Bridge, the, not, the, the bridges across the dam at Novaya Kakhovka. Um, I should say that I've been pronouncing the name of this place as Novaya Kakhova on Telegram. That's how it looks to me. My eyesight, as I said, is not the best. But I've now received an email from a Russian who has explained to me that the correct pronunciation is Novaya Kachovka. I have been omitting by accident the last K. And this Russian, by the way, has told me that every Russian, well, most Russians, uh, know the name of this place because it is the topic of a song. Well, a well-known song. Well, I will try in future to refer to it correctly as Novayak Kachovka. Anyway, coming back to the topic of the bridges. Yesterday, in my programme, I said that the damage to the bridge that the Ukrainians were showing, which was supposed to show the destruction or the, of the Novaya Kachovka bridge, the one across the dam, didn't appear to show that. It appeared to show a much smaller gap of, of a bridge over a, an artificial canal. Now, I've received a number of, I, I, I said that I wasn't absolutely sure of this. I invited people to comment. I got various comments. The long and the short of it is that this break of the bridge is in fact part of the bridge that ultimately crosses the dam at Novaya Kachovka. This is a huge structure and the road and the train line lead up to it. They cross various obstacles as they approach it. One of the obstacles that they approach is this artificial canal and the damage has been done to the small bridge across this canal but we are talking about what is ultimately the same structure as the Novaya Kachovka bridge. Now what I'm also hearing is that though this is clearly a severance of the bridge there it is one that can be repaired very quickly and it's been suggested to me by people who claim to know that this could be done by military engineers using mechanical uh, bridge laying equipment and it could be done in a few hours. It's not to say it will be but that's what I'm told and as I said yesterday it's been suggested as an alternative that you could actually build an earth bridge across this canal also the whether that's really possible or not i'm not going to even try to pretend i'm not a bridge layer or a bridge builder or any kind of engineer so i'm not going to try and guess or speculate about this um, contrary to certain claims i'm also 
told that the position of the railway line is still intact despite appearances. I don't fully understand that, but that's anyway where we seem to be. So this seems to be the situation with the bridge at Novaya Kahovka. The bridge, the other bridge, the Antonovsky Bridge, continues to be the target of missile strikes by Ukraine. It's now suffering lots of strikes by Ukraine and it's clearly not operating. So it's these missile strikes are presumably no longer intended to knock the bridge down. That's not clearly not happened, but it's to prevent it operating. Problem is, it's not clear that the Russians are even attempting any longer to repair the Antonovsky Bridge. Um, there's now lots of pictures circulating of Russian pontoon bridges across the Dnieper River, including one close to the Antonovsky Bridge, and there's apparently a second one now being built. And there are rumours that other pontoon bridges also exist elsewhere along the Dnieper River that the Russian military are using. It's also been pointed out that during the Second World War, the Red Army built pontoon bridges across the Dnieper in six days and were able to advance in force across the Dnieper River, across these pontoon bridges, despite the Luftwaffe being heavily, in, heavily involved and that well, altogether, the idea that the Russian forces west of the Dnieper are cut off from resupply or reinforcement is, well, not just exaggerated, but perhaps even fanciful. Well, I personally don't know how many pontoon bridges there are, but I'm sure that this is correct. I cannot imagine that the Russian military, of all militaries, which is perhaps especially skilled in building bridges and which practices building bridges all the time, would not know how to build pontoon bridges across a river like the Dnieper. I would add, by the way, that um, when I was still a child, I can remember about the pontoon bridges that the Egyptian army, with Soviet help, was able to lay across the Suez Canal during the 1973 war. Um, and this, again, in the face of Israeli air superiority. So I would have thought this was a doable thing. Anyway, there's no sign, and this is perhaps the important thing, there is no sign that this damage to the bridges is impeding Russian military operations west of the Dnieper. And there is no sign, no reason to think that any Russian reinforcements, these armoured columns that we're hearing about, would not be able to cross the Dnieper River if they needed to. I've noticed, by the way, that the British military of Ministry of Defence appears to be saying a great deal less recently about um, the Russian forces west of the Dnieper being cut off from resupply. By the way, speaking of the British Ministry of Defence, they continue to be very cagey about this Russian offensive in Kherson region. And their latest report instead highlights once more the fighting in Donbass. It admits that the main Fighting, the heaviest fighting, is not in Kherson region at all, but in Donbass. It speaks of heavy Russian concentrations building up in Donbass. And it even claims, on the strength of Ukrainian sources, that the Russians aim to clear Donbass entirely of Ukrainian troops by the 15th of September, a date which I would have thought impossible given the um, state of the fighting and which I suspect has simply been plucked out of the air in order to give the Ukrainians the appearance of success when it turns out that Ukrainian troops are still in Donbass by 
the 15th of September. But interestingly, the British Ministry of Defence confirms that the Russian advances continue around Bakhmut city, despite the, uh, even, albeit only at slow speeds, around one kilometre a day, despite my own sense yesterday that the main front for the Russians is the is opposite Donetsk. It's clearing these fortified lines opposite Donetsk city. By the way, that remains my view. And I expect that this third army, that this new force that has been rumbling into Donetsk city itself, we've been seeing pictures of this, uh, that is being deployed to Donbass, to Donetsk city itself, is going to be, is being rolled in to help with the breaking of Ukrainian defences opposite Donetsk city. And whilst I'm on this topic, um, a person we've not been hearing so much about has now resurfaced. This is uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of the Chechen government, who's now been floating the possibility that he might retire. There's speculations, by the way, that if he does retire, he'll be given a very senior post in the Russian Mini, mini, military or in internal security services, perhaps possibly the Roskvadia um, organization. But anyway, Kadyrov has come back and he's saying that um, the Russians have basically um, slow, uh, uh, waited over these last few weeks to see what the Ukrainians would do to, to work out what Ukrainian plans were that they've now worked out those plans from what the Ukrainians have done, and that um, the Russian offensive in Donbass is now going to be reignited with renewed force. And it does indeed seem as if um, Chechen forces, which appear to have stood down after the Battle of Lysychansk, are now being redeployed in large numbers once more in Donbass. So we'll see what comes. I should say, where Kadyrov is concerned, um, I've found that he consistently predicts successes prematurely, but that eventually his predictions, or rather his claims, you could call them predictions rather than claims, turn out to be correct. And that if he says that one particular place has fallen to the Russians, Probably it hasn't fallen when he says, but it does fall a few days or weeks later. So I, I think that we perhaps should take Kadyrov fairly seriously. Now, that brings me to a further issue of Russian credibility, because I have to say that there are now growing doubts, including from many Russian commentators, about these claims that the Russians have made about repeated Ukrainian attempts to storm the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Now, I found these Ukrainian operations to be fantastical, to be borderline ludicrous. And um, I should say that I have always had at the back of my mind, I said this before, my an idea that maybe, maybe, these operations have not had real substance behind them, that they've in fact been cooked up by the Russians out of the broad cloth, um, uh, basically in order to discredit the Ukrainians in advance of the visit of the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors to the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Now, I should say that there is growing scepticism about the Russian claims, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims about these Ukrainian attacks on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, including from the Russian journalistic blogging community that has been covering the war. There's more and more are making out that this whole thing 
is just altogether too far-fetched that the Russian authorities have simply not provided enough information to validate these claims and that it's most likely that this was a propaganda exercise that the Russians carried out precisely for the purpose, I said, in order to discredit the uh, Ukrainians in advance of that mission to the Zap by the inspectors to the uh, nuclear power plant. Now, I'm starting to lean in that direction myself. I would make some important caveats, however. Firstly, if the Russians did just invent this whole, these whole, these, these operations, and by the way, I think they're perfectly capable of do, doing that. This is, after all, a war. And as I've said before, when the Ukrainians have done various things, which some people might find um, annoying and dishonest, people always must remember that, as Churchill said, in a war, the truth is so precious that it must be constantly attended by a bodyguard of lies. This is a war. Uh, sometimes things are said by each side which should be taken very carefully, which shouldn't always be assumed to be true. Each side in a war tries to convey information which um, suits them, and they're not sometimes averse to making things up, and one should maintain scepticism at all times. But I will say this, if the Russians were simply making this whole thing up. I don't understand why the Ukrainians have not said so. I've not, I don't understand either why the Western media and Western governments have not said so as well. And this comes, by the way, at a time when the Ukrainian government in a rather off-the-cuff way, finally admitted that they have indeed been shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. So there's still some possibility that these Russian stories about Ukrainian attempts to storm the nuclear power plant are true. But as I said, I am starting to lean towards the sceptical since in previous videos, I've discussed these attacks on the nuclear power plant, assuming them to be true. I think it's as well that I make it clear that I'm now shifting towards scepticism on these particular Russian claims. Now, speaking about scepticism about claims, I'm going to now turn to a completely different topic, which also, however, relates to the war and that is to Western arms deliveries to Ukraine. Now, I have previously, in earlier videos, expressed my opinion that the West, the Western powers, have not been telling the truth about when some of these arms deliveries that we've been hearing so much about actually began and I've speculated that some of the weapon systems that the Western powers have admitted supplying to Ukraine, especially the anti-tank systems, the javelins and all the rest, that some of them at least were already being supplied to Ukraine in significant numbers before the war began. Well, there's now been a discussion by Jacob Dreisen on his blog. Uh, you have to uh, sign up to it to be able to see it. But Jacob Dreisen uh, says something else which I've also myself come gradually to think, which is that the Western powers, and specifically the United States, have been supplying more weapons to Ukraine than they've admitted to. Now, Dreisen focuses on two particular weapon systems. One is the HIMARS um, multiple rocket launch system, 
the other is the M777 howitzers. And Ryzen points out that given the number of M777 howitzers that the Russians have verifiably destroyed, it seems inconceivable that the Ukrainians um, have not been provided with more M777 howitzers than the United States admits to, given the fact that they are still operating those M777 howitzers in quantity. Therefore, the United States must have supplied at least double the number of M777 howitzers that it claims to have done, and perhaps more than that. I agree. Dreisen also makes the point that the amount of ammunition that the United States is sending to Ukraine, 155 millimeter ammunition, also looks disproportionately large in the event that only 100 M777 howitzers had indeed been supplied. I agree with that as well. On the HIMARS systems, he speculates that Ukraine has at least received at least double the number of HIMARS launchers that um, the United States admits to having sent. So instead of 16, the true number would be closer to 30. Actually, I think that we have a more straightforward explanation of this. I'm not sure that Dreisen um, has noticed but Britain and Germany, at least, have been supplying to Ukraine M270 multiple rocket launch systems. These are American-built multiple rocket launch systems. And um, these launch the same sort of rockets as the HIMARS rockets launch. And if you add all of these systems together, the HIMARS systems the United States has supplied and the M270 systems that Britain and Germany have supplied, then you probably get a total close to the 30 systems that Dreisen speculates have been supplied to Ukraine. Now, Dreisen, however, makes a further point that these supplies of systems uh, guns and launchers, multiple rocket launch systems, but also particularly the ammunition for these systems, that all of these are in being supplied in unsustainable quantities. And that as a result, Pentagon stocks of these systems are now becoming rapidly depleted. And perhaps the starkest point he's making is that at the rate Ukraine is launching HIMARS missiles, which is about 4,000 missiles a month, it's going to run through in two months, in two months, the entire notional production that the manufacturer of the HIMARS missiles, which I believe is Raython, could notionally produce in a year. Raython could produce 9,000 HIMARS missiles in a year, in theory, though it has never done so. Ukraine is running through that number of missiles over a period of two months. And in fact, Ukraine might be rapidly running through US stocks existing stocks of HIMARS missiles, allegedly 30,000 when the war began. Well, if you, you can do your own calculations at the rate of expenditure of 4,000 a month, in nine to 10 months, the total stock of HIMARS systems, HIMARS missiles will have been completely used up. Now, that's not going to happen the United States is going to have to slow down deliveries of HIMARS missile systems even as it reopens production of HIMARS missiles. And these are apparently very expensive missiles to produce. They're high-tech, 
in my opinion, probably too high tech for the kind of weapon system that we're talking about, but they're very expensive. They are, they use a lot of sophisticated components. Um, producing them is going to be expensive. And frankly, this latest package of $13 billion um, of um, aid and re-equipment that Biden is now applying to Congress for, um, that points to the growing difficulties that the United States is having in keeping Ukraine supplied with the weapon systems that it needs. By the way, there was a very long article in the Daily Telegraph of all places, which pointed to the same thing, that the, that the Western powers are now struggling to keep up with Ukrainian demands for 155 millimeter caliber ammunition, which may explain, by the way, why in the last but one uh, US arms package, the United States started was supplying to Ukraine 105 millimeter guns in place of 155 millimeter guns. So we're seeing that in this industrial war, the US is starting to flag. And coming back to that $13 billion package, it's important to note that this seems to be additional to that $40 billion package that we were hearing all about a few months ago. So it looks as if the United States has already run through all the previous packages that it had, that Congress had authorized, and now the administration is having to come back to Congress to make to get authorization to keep some kind of flow of aid to Ukraine still running. Now, this now leads me to the next issue because I discussed in many programs the gathering energy crisis in Europe and it's now clear that European governments are in a massive quandary about what to do. And we've had proposals from various governments. It seems that the German government is going to, is going to commit 65 billion euros to trying to um, provide, to subsidize energy consumption by German consumers. The British government is talking about a price cap for energy lots of governments around Europe seem to be struggling to come up with the same kind of ideas. And when you look at all the proposals that are being made, they seem to me to amount to one of two things, either subsidies, in other words, money from the government in huge quantities, or in the alternative, price caps. Now, the problem with these two policies, subsidies and price caps, is that they do not produce any extra gas. What they actually do is support demand. If people can afford gas because the price of gas is being fixed, they will continue to consume gas in the same quantity that they did before. If the if, if consumers are being given money to buy gas, they will continue to buy gas in the same quantities as they did before. Now, if gas is in short supply, that is inevitably going to lead to shortages. What this, these plans do is that they deconstruct the operation of the price mechanism. It means that... <laughs> The price mechanism is not being used as in a market economy. It should be used to try to reduce consumption for a commodity, in this case gas, which is in short supply. So inevitably, 
the result is going to be gas shortages. And that means black blackouts. Now, <laughs> that, it seems to me, is the in inexorable position that this plan is going to lead us to, these plans are going to lead us to, unless the Europeans are extremely lucky and we have a very warm winter this year. But bear in mind that even if we have a warm winter this year, this only kicks the can down the road a few months because then, of course, you have next year to worry about. Now, in the absence of increased supply to meet demand, what do you do if you're going to impose these price caps and you are going to try to subsidise energy use? Well, it seems to me that the only thing you can do if you're going to try and keep prices at these kind of levels is you're going to have to introduce some form of energy rationing. And given that the priority for governments is going to be to keep people warm in their homes, that must inevitably mean less energy for industrial and commercial users. It is the iron law of economics that if you don't allow the mar market, the price mechanism to work, if you don't allow for a market solution to work, then you have no real option other than to intervene even more aggressively and in effect to impose some kind of control. Now, I think many people would be worried by that in inherently, but let's put ideological concerns about the operation of free markets to one side and focus on the consequences. Because if we have rationing and industrial and commercial users get less energy, then that means they are going to be producing less. Now, all of these plans are going to cost money. Now, all of this is happening at the same time that central banks are tightening monetary policy. The European Central Bank claims that it's ending its QE system. The Federal Reserve Board in the United States is doing the same thing. The United States Federal Reserve Board is raising interest rates, as is the Bank of England, and the European Central Bank is being pushed along unhappily in their wake. It too is being forced to raise interest rates as well. That means that without QE, at least in theory, and with, uh, uh, gov and with, and with governments apparently unwilling to raise taxes in the face of this emergency, I mean, that uh, raising taxes in order to subsidise energy use would, to my mind, negate the value of those subsidies. But anyway, without governments willing to raise taxes and with output falling, governments may struggle to borrow. <laughs> um, and of course, without borrowing, if there is no QE, how do they raise the money to do all of these various things? Well, the big risk is that pressure will grow in Europe to start resuming some kind of QE. Now, the QE we've had in the past, the quantitative easing we have had in the past, has been QE which has been focused on supporting the financial system. It's the big beneficiaries of it have been the banks and other financial institutions. And they've had massive amounts of money to work with. And that, by the way, has resulted in a rise in asset prices, which is something we have seen consistently happen over the last 10 plus years. But any new form of money printing is not going to be used for that purpose, because if it is being used 
to subsidize energy use at a time when output is falling. It is being used to sustain demand at a time when there is less production, less output of goods. So this is going to bring more inflation through a different route because if demand remains strong but production is falling, if there are fewer goods on sale, then inevitably that is going to lead to higher inflation. Now, one way, of course, to try to get around this problem is to try to import goods. But doing so means becoming increasingly dependent on East Asian producers. And, of course, it also is going to start to push up deficits, trade deficits in Europe. And do so, moreover, with no end in sight. And it's also going to accelerate deindustrialization processes in Europe. Because if you take a step back and think what all of this doing means, it means that you are replacing goods that you used to produce with goods that you're now importing. And that makes you dependent on imports. And, even, and it also means that when the crisis ends, and your, your own domestic producers come back on stream, they have to compete directly against the imported goods which have already captured a large part of your market, your consumer and internal domestic market. So that's going to intensify processes of deindustrialization. But it's also inevitably going to have inflationary consequences because, of course, goods you import make you dependent on prices set by overseas producers, which tends to be inflationary. And, of course, the bigger your import bill becomes, the more pressure that puts on your currency. And, in fact, as we are seeing, both European currencies, the euro and sterling, are declining and are continuing to decline. So all of this seems to me to be a recipe for deindustrialization and inflation. They are not really a solution to the underlying problem. It is debatable how long this can hold. If there's a cold winter, as some meteorologists are predicting, though I don't think you can place much faith on that, but anyway, as some meteorologists are apparently are predicting, then I suspect that this whole thing will become unstuck fairly quickly, in which case we will have a major financial crisis in Europe and we could see inflation surge. If we have a warm winter, which is consistent with the pattern, well then it's possible, it's conceivable, that we will somehow stagger through the winter, but our industrial structure in Europe will start to degrade and degrade fast. And of course, as the industrial structure degrades, jobs will start to disappear, inflation, uh, unemployment will start to uptick, that will impose further pressures on um, European uh, welfare systems, which are very generous. And of course, that could eventually snowball into more problems. These are not good options. <laughs> the correct option is to do what Matteo Salvini, the Italian politician, is now suggesting, which is to try to seek some kind of end to the sanctions war. But that, of course, is not what European leaders are talking about. We saw instead Annalena Baerbock saying that she's going to continue with this, uh, this economic war until the West wins in Ukraine. She's going to do, continue however long it takes, however hard it is for 
people in Europe, however hard it is for people in Germany. In practice, even Baerbock can't simply disregard concerns amongst German electors. It may be that her words were one of the triggers for that big protest we've just seen in Prague. I believe that she made her comments about the fact that even if German voters protest, she will continue along the course that she set herself. I believe that she made those comments as it happens during some kind of meeting in Prague. And if that is correct, then perhaps people in the Czech Republic picked up on it, and that might have, for all I know, boosted the size of the turnout in this big protest that we saw in Prague. Now, the fact is, European governments looking at these protests, sensing the electoral consequences, worried about the political problems, well, they are going to try to spend their way out of this crisis. And as I said, they're going to do that through the two courses that I've said, either price caps or subsidies. The problem is that they might be buying off trouble in the very short term, but they're piling it up in a disastrous way for the not very long term. As I said, how long that term is depends principally now on the weather. One way or another, this is turning out, shaping out to be a disastrous policy. Now, two other European politicians have been making comments recently. One has been Macron, who basically admits that we're going to be living in an age of austerity, indefinite austerity from now on. The age of abundance, according to Macron, is over. Sacrificed on the altar of Ukraine. Not Ukraine the country, which is also being sacrificed, but this totem pole of Ukraine, which is really the West's anti-Russian policy. But perhaps even more remarkable for me was a comment made by Germany's Vice-Chancellor, Robert Habeck. Habeck, who has been leading the charge, along with Ursula von der Leyen, in imposing all these sanctions came forward and admitted that the era of cheap, reliable energy from Russia is now gone forever. And as I understand it, he even admitted that this is depriving Germany of a competitive advantage which was essential for the success of its economic model. Now, on the Duran, we've been saying that for months. Habeck, Germany's own economics minister, appears now finally to have understood this. He's understood that at the very best, if everything turns out as he hopes, which is most unlikely, by the way, if Germany and Europe somehow stagger through this winter, find some kinds of alternative energy from who knows what source, are able to keep going, still their energy will be much more expensive than it was, and that will lend, render them less competitive against Asian producers. And he appears to be sanguine about this prospect. He the economics minister of Germany, Germany's vice chancellor. He's prepared to see Germans cold. He's prepared to see German factories close. And he's prepared to put Germany in a long-term uncompetitive position. I have to say that it seems to me extraordinary now, I've just seen an opinion poll which has recently been taken in Germany. I don't have the exact figures immediately to hand, but they all show overwhelming support from German voters for negotiations with Russia to bring this conflict in Ukraine 
to an end. So German voters understand this, but Germany's own vice chancellor apparently doesn't. And this vice chancellor, even though he heads a party which only won 15% of the vote in the last German legislative election a year ago, it's this German vice chancellor, Robert Habeck, whose will prevails, who will help rather have people go cold, who's coming up with plans which could increase inflation rates, in fact, almost certain to increase inflation rates in Germany, that's going to put further pressure on the euro, that will deindustrialize the country, that will put jobs at risk, and that will leave Germany in a position of long-term uncompetitiveness. Germany's vice chancellor is prepared to persist with all of this, even though an overwhelming majority, I think it was 78% of Germans, want to see negotiations uh, initiated to bring this conflict to an end. Well, it seems to me that these political leaders in Germany and elsewhere need to start listening to their people. They need to remember that if Germany, Europe, really is the receptacle of democratic values that they pretend it is, it is the people, not they, who are supposed to have the ultimate power. Imposing these utterly destructive policies on Europe because, to say it frankly, they miscalculated disastrously at the start of the sanctions war, assuming that the Russian economy would implode when it hasn't, and not being prepared for the possibility that the war of attrition would continue indefinitely as it is doing. Well, they need to understand, they need to admit to themselves that they got it wrong and they need to change course. And as I have said in my recent programs, if changing course means that because of their shattered credibility, they need to go, then go they should. Price caps and subsidies are not the solution to this problem. Well, that's me for the day. It's already been a long video. Much more from me soon. Remember, you can find us, all our videos on Rumble, Locals, Odyssey, uh, BitChute and Telegram. You can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. And last but not least, remember that you can come to our shop and buy the many great things that you will find there. More from me soon. On this somewhat bleak note, I shall leave you now. Rem and remember, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button and check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again. And have a very good day.